Hello, and welcome to Conversations with Linda. I'm Linda. You know I love a good conversation, so let's have one. Now, before we have our conversation, I want to give you a dose of good medicine. You know, laughter is good for the soul. Watch this. Stop balling up and falling up and so we can't even figure out what it is. It's going to be a dollar just laid out in there. It's all right. It won't hurt. Our we had to go to Family Dollar and buy our, buy our iron. The iron out of all the dollars because we can't even tell what they are. I work in the trustee ministry and... Uh, we're trying to go to Golden Corral, too. By the time we iron out all the dollars, everything is closed. We, and we don't even cook on Sunday no more. So just lay it in the plate. It's still going to be a dollar. Amen? Amen. Come on, y'all. Let's just get along. Come on. Help us out. Because we ushers. We ushers. Amen? We're here to serve you. What, was that not hilarious? Wait a minute. Y'all know if you've ever been in church, you know people put dollars in Y'all know how we put dollars in the in the plate. And she just wanted you to just lay the dollar out. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Help the Urshas out. The Urshas. Help the Urshas out so they can get to go to Corral. Like, like we want to get to. So come on now. Let's have our conversation. Reverend Devontae Hill has been noted as one of the nation's youngest revolutionists. Across the world, Devante has been recognized as a 21st century generational leader, trailblazing through the vacillating social changes of government, grassroots movements, and community. From our nation's capital to the deep south of the Delta, Devante's gift for organizational leadership and his resilience to impact government righteously has been historical to say the least. Hill has been able to peacefully draw thousands of people to a consolidated principle through protests that has ultimately shifted legislation, sparked policy change, and garnered important support for marginalized communities through the allocation of needed resources. Devante believes that through reflection of the heart, we can change the world. Conversations with Linda, welcome to our episode tonight, Reverend Devante Hill. God bless you. Good to meet you, see you, and thank you for coming to the show. Bless you, Pastor Linda. Thank you for inviting me and having me here with the uh, conversations with Linda. I'm honored to be here. I, I feel like I'm in the presence of a celebrity because oh, no. you have made a name for yourself. <laughs> no, I'm in the presence of kingdom, a <laughs> kingdom leader, so I'm excited to be here. Too. So tell, I call them my chit chatters. Tell our chit chatters who Reverend Devontae Hill really is, and how did you get started in the activist world? Um, so I'm 29 years old. I guess I'll be 30 wow. in about six months, give or take. Um, and I am uh, born and raised Memphis. Okay. As a child, grew up out in Tipton County, Covington, Tennessee. Okay. So I'm a city kid, mixed with a country kid. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, I never really had an ambition. And initially, I wanted to be a dentist. Really? And uh, went to the military, uh, retired from the military in D.C. Okay. And landed up working for our current congressman on Capitol Hill, Congressman Steve Wow. Cohen. Um, through that, just a whirlwind of opportunity opened up working on Capitol Hill. And I just became very passionate about things that plagued communities that uh, rendered themselves voiceless oftentimes. Mm. And it just catapulted me from there. Wow. So did you have any family members that had been in activism, in politics, anything? No. Actually, my dad, who whom I just met five years ago. Okay. Uh, my you know you got to tell me a little bit of that because I, I kind of read something about sure. that too. Incredible story. Uh, so my dad was a part of a movement that was happening in the early 90s when the Ku Klux Klan was coming in to the city okay. to uh, march on Martin Luther King's day. Had no idea that he was even that type of a guy when I met him five years ago, mm. but it just reverberated that God's plan for my life was exactly what it was. So I, I never really had any other family members that were in politics. I just rendered myself to the voice and the will of God, and he just continued to open doors. 
Yes, so I love it when people have these kinds of stories because I really believe in divine providence. Yeah. So you said I heeded to the voice of the Lord. So were those like whispers, nudgings? Because people, are, you know, they want to know. How, how did you know the Lord was saying do this? I think I ran into so many dead ends. To okay. Was, okay, God's not here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I love God's it. I love there. it. And eventually, I started realizing where my grace was. Mm. Um, oh, that's powerful. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's powerful because I believe in that. Yeah, yeah. Realizing where your grace was. Say a little bit more about that because somebody's going to say, well, what does he mean by sure, that? Sure, sure. You know, each and every one of us, we are graced in the place that God wants to use us the most. Mm -hmm. A great, great man of God once said, that great men and women were born for the time that God needs them the most. Mm. And so I feel like, you know, for the work that I am doing, God needs me. Everything he has to do in the mm -hmm. earth, he has to use man. He has to he can't go against his own word. He said, let mm -hmm. them have dominion. And so it's our responsibility, our divine responsibility to figure out what it is that God wants us to do mm -hmm. and become confident in that grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go back to that. <laughs> yes, There's sir. more to say. Yes, sure. Um, but on July 10th, 2016, in Memphis, that was a huge day because there was this big protest, this demonstration that took place on the Hernando de Soto Bridge in the State 40. Can you tell us about it? Sure. Uh, working on Capitol Hill, um, mm -hmm. I realized that there was a significant amount of funding and resources going into our city. Okay. And uh, I was actually watching the news and mm -hmm. realizing that Perhaps, where, why are these funds and this support not connecting with grassroots community? Okay. So uh, I scheduled a meeting with the mayor, the current mayor, mm -hmm. and uh, you just called it. Just called the office, say, "Hey, I'm working on Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. and uh, I want to schedule a meeting with you in Memphis. I'm going to fly to Memphis." Okay. Um, and I also called the interim police director at that time, mm -hmm. uh, Director Rollins, and uh, scheduled a meeting. Okay. I landed into Memphis the next day, mm -hmm. and. The mayor me canceled his meeting, and Director Rollins became really busy. I think there was a, a, a lot of activity happening the night prior. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I kept calling him, trying to figure out when we were going to reschedule mm -hmm. because I deeply had an ambition to become uh, active in, okay. our, in our community. But mm -hmm. I wanted to have a pulse on what was really going on. Okay. Uh, they, I guess, assimilated me with some of the other uh, grassroots activists here mm -hmm. in our city. And I believe each and every one of us have a place, sure. and each and every one of us have a methodology. Um, but the way God showed me to do things was completely different from the way that they had been that they had been doing things years okay. prior. Uh, God wanted to do something brand new. He mm -hmm. wanted to do something different and spark up something that had never been sparked here in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it started with a started with a flyer that I literally on this phone here that I have. I still have the the flyer photos. I put a flyer together, put it out on social media, mm -hmm. pushed it out to Memphis influencers, if you will. Mm -hmm. Had an expectation of 500 people showing up, maybe, mm -hmm. give or take, just mm -hmm. based on um, the following that I have. Uh -huh. And uh, 30 minutes prior to the protest actually starting, there were already 500 people there. Wow. And so, um, you know, it's quite a catastrophic day, but definitely a day that... I, I definitely felt the the mantle of Moses mm. fall on me that day. Mm. Uh, I could feel the the anointing of Moses all over me that day, mm -hmm. and um, I think it's just a just a revelatory moment that mm. will forever be etched into the history of our city forever. Wow. And I'm grateful that God would allow me to be a part of it. So, you just put a flyer out. Put a flyer and out, and people just showed up. It, it, I think it was a sentiment, not just not, it was a sentiment of. Not just a flyer, but more along more along the lines that our city was hurting. Yeah. And people understood that pain, that 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 black marginalized, voiceless pain. So, so my question with that, I guess, because I, I remember, you know, hearing your name, and I'm saying, well, who is that? You know, I didn't know. Um, but why you? Why why? What did you have that a flyer could draw? I mean. You know, because that wasn't the first time people yeah. had been hurting, you sure. know, but, but you did it, and they showed up. Instructions from the Lord. 
Yeah. Instructions from the that Lord. Grace. <laughs> that grace. Yeah, that grace. It was that grace. Y'all I, get it? That grace. <laughs> it was that grace. I, I really believe that when God has a purpose for your life. He will grace you in that He'll day. grace you for it. And there is a, a, you have favor with people yeah. to get the job done. Yeah. So I, I love that. So speak to the impact that that had on the city. What, what came of that? So for me, and of course everyone has their own interpretation of what results came from that moment, but for me, a massive spark happened in our city. People okay. began to really have those conversations. I know for me personally, I began to be invited to tables with the Greater Memphis Chamber of Commerce. Okay. Uh, began to be invited to tables that talked about how to equal the playing field and what does equity look like for black people. Okay. More than just your large white church on the hill sending a check over into the black community. Yeah. Yeah. How do we really empower the people? And so okay. those conversations started from there. Um, I know there was a uh, there was a disproportionate amount of uh, funds that were not going into black communities as mm -hmm. it pertains to black contracts, mm -hmm. um, with bidding with the city, if you will. And okay. so from those from th those meetings and that protest sparked an internal investigation on mm -hmm. you know how money was being public works money five hundred and fifty million dollars how wow. was that money being spent uh -huh. in the city and, and why were african americans not able to get those contracts and how do we groom companies mm. that are black companies or That's, black yeah. owned businesses yeah. to where they can handle the capacity of a mm -hmm. contract like that mm -hmm. so just just a long list of stuff you know wow. conversations on racism conversations on re police reform so just Having having a moment where those conversations started was just essential to bring us to the point to where we are now. You know, as I listen to you talk, I'm wondering, you know, I asked you who you are and how did you get started in this, but were you hurting in particular? I mean, did this, you know, I know you were, you're, you're the Moses, you know, <laughs> of your day. I get that. But I'm saying, was there a place in you that you had felt marginalized? How did that... For sure. What was that uh, born in you? I, I use Moses as an example, not just because of the anointing that we read about and we are so impressed about, mm -hmm. but Moses was dealing, he was leading and bleeding at the same time, Absolutely. is what I say. He was dealing with an internal identity crisis. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Much like Moses and mm -hmm. his mom, who had to put him into the Nile River to just to protect him. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom was 14 when I was born. And, you know, wow. she, had, she had to literally hide me in her pregnancy to keep from having to abort me as a child. Wow. So I oftentimes feel like my mom is equivalent to Moses' mom. Mm. You know, Moses had a, an identity crisis on where he was really from and who his father really was. Uh -huh. And so for me, you know, I had a father who raised me, but he wasn't my biological mm. father. And so I had an internal identity crisis as well. But I knew God called me to lead. And mm -hmm. so I... Of course, absolutely felt that internal pain that Moses had. And as far as being voiceless and marginalized, absolutely. I had okay. a run-in with a detective who is no longer on the force. He okay. was actually fired. Uh -huh. um, he he would just, just made a very racist comment towards me. you uh -huh. know. And I, I lived in D.C., but I called to the Memphis Police Department. And I told him, I'm flying in. I'm going to deal with this. Mm. And, uh, you know, he, he made an attempt to deal with me, and in the end, God won. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> in the end, yeah. God won. So it, it was just very personal for me. Yeah, yeah. It was much more than just being out in front. It was like, no, I, I've been a victim of this myself. Yeah. So I understand this pain. I understand this hurt. Yeah. This so... When you think about Moses, Moses had a great sense of inadequacy. He didn't feel like he was the man for the job, you know. Have you felt? I mean, because you're you're only 29, yeah. getting ready to be 30, <laughs> you know. But you see, your your presence, your persona you. is so confident, you Thank know, you. so poised. Has there been any sense of, you know, Lord? Are, are you sure? You know, <laughs> me. Um, and I, and I, I'll go so far as to use the word insecurity. Mm -hmm. um, I think I have just now, just to be quite frank with you, after meeting my dad, mm -hmm. you know, I started to develop this confidence. Okay, this is really who I am. This is not a thought in my head. Okay, I am who I actually am. Okay, so meeting him gave you another it level. Solidified my identity. Okay, gotcha. It, it solidified my identity because not only was I insecure about 
such a great task that the Lord was putting in front of me. Uh -huh. I also was worried about my personal insecurities and my mm. personal brokenness yeah. uh, being exposed to the world and yeah. how and, and how would I handle that and if I had the capacity to handle that. Mm -hmm. I think in 2016, I did not have the capacity that I have today mm -hmm. to be able to handle just the exposure of all of that because I never knew how big God wanted to move. Oh, wow. Um, but now that I'm in his will, I understand yeah. you know, it's a big assignment and comes with big responsibilities absolutely yes, absolutely awesome awesome look i i know you're enjoying this conversation as much as i am with uh reverend Devonte hill he is i'm telling you i mean there's an energy even in the room Thank in his you. presence and so we're going to take a commercial break and we're going to be right back to continue this conversation <music> Welcome back to Conversations with Linda. I am having an awesome, powerful conversation uh, with Reverend Devonte Hill. You remember him, the activist. We just finished talking about the protest there on the Hernando Bridge, and he is just giving us um, some reflections on that and really what was going on even behind the scenes in his heart and in his mind. So... I've got so much more to ask sure, you about. Sure, I'm um, trying to take. You've done a lot, and I'm trying to just kind of hit the high points. Yeah, but yeah. in 2020, you and Frank Gotti met with city officials, and you stated that uh, you felt like state officials were then committed to change. Do you still feel that way? You know, our country is just in a unique place, uh -huh. yeah, and I think we are at a crossroad as a country. Yeah, yeah. So quite naturally, as a state. And as a city, uh -huh. we are faced with those same crossroads. Okay. And uh, people who are, le more specifically, legislative officials, uh -huh. they're having to find themselves on the right side of history. Yeah. And, you know, I believe in grace. And I know mm -hmm. we don't have a whole lot of time to wait as black people, as people of color, because we've been waiting for quite some time. Yeah. Um, but I think that there are some individuals who are committed to change. I think the time and the tone is much different today. Mm -hmm. You know, the reality is, in 2016, the term or phrase "Black Lives Matter," mm -hmm. you know, was a was a terrible term. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can remember watching, looking at the news articles on social media, yeah. and seeing I was being called a, a tourist and a thug and all these good natures because I was riding under the banner of Black Lives Matter. Uh -huh. Whereas last, in 2020, it seems as if the conversation changed. Yeah. And the same people who were calling me a, a, a you know. A, all types of names, if you will, <laughs> they're now marching with me. You know, yeah, they are now out yeah. there with me. And uh -huh. they, they don't look like me, but they're saying, I want to know and understand mm -hmm. what it is that you all are feeling. I think George Floyd's death yeah. opened the door for that for a lot of us. Uh -huh. um, so I think the time and the tide and the tone uh, has changed since okay. 2016. So I think that for me resembles some degree of progress. Okay. Okay. Um, but I think that there's a very, very long road to go ahead uh -huh. that we have to continue to stay committed to. One of the things that I... I discerned and just felt as I listened to some of your clips is that you are a voice of hope. There is a there is this streak of optimism Thank you. that you have. Has it always been that way? Are you just an optimistic person <laughs> or are you just optimistic about this? I think I've, I, I've raised by my grandmother. Okay. Just learn. My grandparents raised me okay. and uh, just learning to always look at the glass half full rather yeah. than half empty. Yeah. You know, I, I watch my grandparents make a make a lot with a little. Mm -hmm. You know, I, my grandmother okay. would take forty dollars into the grocery store, yeah. and just come out with just bags on top of bags. Yeah. And so, yeah. for me, I've learned to just be optimistic with what's in front of us, mm -hmm. to give people opportunity, give people space. And you know, I, you know, I think we call people to accountability when we have communicated effectively, mm -hmm. and we've done all that we can. All right. And I think that is what had been ha what had been absent um, in times prior to this moment okay. here, you know, there was such an aggression and a passion and a mm -hmm. rage that those who desperately needed to hear 
couldn't necessarily mm. hear beyond that rage, beyond yeah. that passion, beyond that righteous frustration. Yeah. Um. So I, I for me, I've been you know, through therapy. I've learned to communicate even when I don't agree. Okay. Or to communi- therapy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, black men <laughs> need to go to the therapy. therapy. I, you know, that's another hat yeah. I wear is a, 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 that of a therapist, yes. and I am for that. Yeah. And I am so thankful that, especially your generation, uh, is embracing the idea of therapy to work through your issues doesn't mean that we don't still have these global issues and issues in our country but there's some personal stuff that we have to work through that then as you said allows us to speak beyond the rage you know the beyond the hostility so that we can communicate effectively and really be heard and understood absolutely so that is so good okay i'm proud of you (laughs) thank you all right um so let's switch gears a little bit On March 18th, 2021, you were on a panel with other city leaders to interview candidates for a Memphis police uh, director. You you really asked some tough questions, and you asked about the uh, demilitarizing the police department and called a few candidates out on their credentials. So here's my question. Do you feel that the current director is living up to who she presented herself to be in that interview? Sure. Um, much like any leader, any CEO, any uh-huh. pastor, bishop, apostle, Absolutely. when you go into a structure that is already in place, uh-huh. the most immature thing that you, or premature and immature thing that you could probably do mm-hmm. when going into that structure is begin to dismantle it abruptly. Sure. So I, uh, I'm quite pleased with the uh, the grace that C.J. Davis is operating in here presently, how she is making an attempt to not completely dismantle the mm-hmm. entire police department just yet, okay. but allowing allowing the police department to function and understand what are the functionalities, what are the things, the areas of opportunity, where mm-hmm. can we change, where can we, um, where can we grow, and where okay. can we be more hands on. So I, you know, from the beginning, before I had even seen any of the applicants, for me it was like we need a black woman to be a police director. Mm-hmm. Um, super proud, even now, you know, one of the Supreme Court justices is retiring after 28 mm-hmm. years, mm-hmm. and this administration, this presidential administration, vowed to put a black woman Yay. in um, the Supreme Court. Uh-huh. So for me, it is just time for black women to lead. It's yeah, time for yeah. us to trust black women. Black mm-hmm. women get the job done. They yeah. don't get on their knees and pray. Mm-hmm. And so I, the Lord told me that a black woman was going to be our police director at the beginning of that wow. process. Wow. And I stuck to that again, hearing and heeding to the voice of uh-huh. God. So, you know, many may have their skepticism of C.J. Davis currently and presently. She just got here. Right, <laughs> she right, just right. got here. But I think it's because you said something in one of your clips about you know, we want that microwave fix. We want things to happen quickly. And we feel it's long overdue. Mm-hmm. And so when a new person comes into office, you know, that is the challenge of giving people something sure. to satisfy that, you know, we're wanting, we've been waiting, even though you're new, we've been we've waiting been on waiting. Cha- a long time. Yeah. You know, how do you balance that? Sure. Um, you know, I believe I believe the pressure and the pains of leadership are are you know intricate to evolving any structure. Yeah. You know, I think we have to understand. You know, I, I know you got you and, and Bishop are pastoring this mm-hmm. beautiful church, mm-hmm. and I know you all as you all bring in leaders and bring out leaders, transition leaders. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that there is oftentimes tension when you're trying to do something that has never been done before. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a healthy tension. That's okay. a, that, that that keeps the leader accountable to, to their Absolutely. words, to their Absolutely. change, and whatever their presentation, their vision, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also brings the community to accountability as well to yeah. hold true to the things that they'd like to see. Yeah. So I think as our government works together, as mm-hmm. our police department, as our city legislators, as our community, our churches, our grassroots, as we begin to simultaneously work together, mm-hmm. we'll be able to look back and see progress mm-hmm. um, along the way. But I think being in the moment, present, it's kind of difficult to see progress when you're yeah. presently watching the news and seeing this and that. Mm-hmm. Um, but time always shows what progress really looks like. So you said something in the clip. You sure. talked about utilizing the process. And I keep hearing you saying, you know, uh, talking about process. But how do you speak to your generation 
you know, my generation, we're kind of in that middle. Our parents definitely were patient. And then my generation, we were a little bit more anxious, if you will. But now your generation, I have a son and daughter around your age. How do you, how do you motivate them or inspire them or give the message of, you know, you know, keep, keep hanging in there. Don't give up. Don't, don't become apathetic and just say, cause you know, I, I talk to a lot of millennials and they do feel like, Oh, it'll never change. You know, why even be involved? Sure. What do you say to them? I know what you're saying to me, Pastor Linda as a 54 year old woman, but talk to me how you would talk to them. What sure. would you say? You know, we all have a part to play. Okay. And if you begin to jump into the game, begin to play your part, Okay. Time will pass you by mm -hmm. as you are playing your part okay. and doing your role. Okay. And as that time passes by, mm -hmm. you'll be able to look back and see your contribution to society, your peers' contribution to society, okay. and then again, mm -hmm. you'll have the ability, to, a barometer, to measure that progress and mm -hmm. what progress has been made over time. Mm -hmm. I think for my generation, we do sometimes have this microwave mentality. Yeah. You know, we are the microwave generation, the internet generation. Yeah, yeah. Whatever we wanted to know, your generation prior, which is probably five years ahead of mine, <laughs> uh, your generation would have gone to the library and yeah. did some research and uh -huh. found some books, etc. Mm -hmm. Our generation, we pick up our cell phone Absolutely. and the information. We can readily at any moment figure out what's happening at any place in mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. And we would have to wait on the news to come on to mm -hmm. figure out what's happening in, in New York mm -hmm. in, the, in the 80s and mm -hmm. in the early 90s. So... I think our accessibility has in some ways played to our disadvantage, but we've got to be able to use those as tools. Dr. King and the difference between Dr. King and uh, Malcolm X mm -hmm. was all about the process. Right. Malcolm, and, we, and, and our generation has got to figure out who do you want to be in, mm -hmm. in, in this. And I think the thing that did not happen, that was about to happen, that if God would have let it be, be yeah. so, we probably wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. King and Malcolm X were, were finally coming into a That's space right. where they were going to be able to work together. Right. That's so true. Malcolm X's, uh, Malcolm X's passion yeah. for the system will always be broken. Mm -hmm. And Dr. King, let's use the system to our advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Had those two things come together, I think we would have seen uh, a dramatic amount of change. So mm -hmm. my my suggestion to my generation mm -hmm. would be to utilize those processes, figure out how, how are other people formulating legislative processes and how okay. are these bills that we don't like, mm -hmm. how are these bills being passed and how do we come against those bills? Yeah. So one of the things that I'm observing as I listen to you talk is you do have a grasp of the process. What about those young men and women who are who don't have that grace, who's, who's never been to uh, uh, Congress, never met Steve Cohen. Sure. And, you know, how do we talk to them? Sure. Because uh, I'm sure, you know, a lot of my chit-chatters there around my age, maybe yeah. a little younger, a little older, and um, there are things that we learned in school about how government works, and we believed it at that time. Yeah. I don't even know people believe it yeah. anymore, but they certainly may not even know. Um, sure how it works, Sure. how can they, without having the grace that Devontae Hill has, sure. how can they n learn about the process? Well, it, the process for them is figuring out what their purpose is. Okay. You know, it, I don't care if you if you are a gangbanger on the street, mm -hmm. or you just served 25 years to life and you just got out, figure out where your grace is, figure out what your purpose is. Okay and reroute that rage, you okay. know, the rage that you feel for injustice. Reroute. Y'all hear that? Reroute that rage. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Not telling you not, not to Not to angry. have it, just reroute, reroute it. it. into a okay. positive space, you know. Uh -huh. I got a, got a friend now that uh, I talk to almost every day. Uh -huh. Did a long time in jail, got out, and now he's like a massive inspiration to young people. Goes mm -hmm. to high schools and mm -hmm. talks to young people. Mm -hmm. That's his grace. That's his he grace. He rerouted that rage. And uh, super proud of them. And I think that each and every one of us, we have a place in society. And we mm -hmm. just got to figure out what that is. And, and I want to go back to what you said before we take commercial break. You said you found it by doing something. I came to so many dead ends. Dead like, okay, ends. God's not there. 
I love that. I love that. <laughs> oh, I found out here. You know, because oftentimes we feel those dead ends means that, you know, there's nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. It's just that you got to find where the door is, is open. Yeah. Where, okay. Yeah. You know, find out who does love you. Yeah. Even if somebody doesn't love you, find out who Somebody you. loves you. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, we're going to take another commercial break. I think this is an awesome conversation. This is, I know I keep referring to, um, the millennial generation, but I'm talking to each one of you, what, what, no matter what age you are, I, I love the fact that we've got to continue to utilize the process. Utilize we'll be right process. back. Welcome back to Conversations with Linda. Listen, Chit Chatters, I am having a delightful time uh, with my guest, Reverend Devonte Hill. This young man, 29 years old, on his way to being 30, has just a wealth of experience, wealth of knowledge, inspirational, motivational, and listen, you ought to be motivated now, even just listening to him. I know I am. So, Reverend Devonte Hill. Yes, ma'am, Pastor Linda. Tell me about your thoughts and reflections on the recent um, case of Ahmaud Aubrey and those convictions. It, reflecting on summer 2020 as a whole, I think one of the most painful uh, of, of the many scenarios that happened mm -hmm. that year had to be the Ahmaud Aubrey. Yeah. Uh, murder, I would murder. call it that, mm -hmm. and I think even the trial was probably a bit painful as well. Mm -hmm. Just hearing the position of of the defense attorneys and some of just the derogatory things that they would have said in the trial, yeah. uh, I think it is uh, once again just like George Floyd. I think yeah. it is once again another victory mm -hmm. and another sphere of hope that we have to we have to acknowledge so mm -hmm. that we can continue to build our momentum. You know, wins yeah. like that uh, fuel and give gas to, mm -hmm. to those of us who are in this fight of injustice. Yeah. Um, so for me, incredibly glad and just grateful that mm -hmm. justice was able to actually happen in this instance. Mm -hmm. I think that there was just an incredible amount of pressure that we did have to put on Georgia, yeah. the, <laughs> the governor of Georgia, the yeah. judges in Brunswick, Georgia. Um, I, I went with my pastor down, with Dr. Jamal Bryant. We went down, you know, for the day that the the verdict was read. Okay. And uh, they didn't want our 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 leaders, our cultural leaders, yeah. into the courtroom. You right. Know, just Jesse Jackson and Absolutely. Al Sharpton, and they barely wanted Benjamin Crump into the room, and he's the, yeah. the lead attorney. So uh, I think it is a it is a uh, it is a testament of where our time is mm -hmm. in, in, in essence. But it also lets us know that when we Utilize the process mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and remain vigilant to the process, yeah. not our process, but the process that's already in place. Mm -hmm. We can utilize those processes to our advantage and uh, justice will be served. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about um, there's this uh, new um, sick segment on that's been on Women of the Movement. I don't know if you've seen that. And um, it's looking at it's having women tell their stories who've lost their children, Emmett Till's mm -hmm, mother, mm -hmm. all of that. And so, you know, it's all of these years later and we're still losing our boys, losing yeah. our children. Um, but I love the fact that you find hope in even that one case. And that's, uh, I hope you all are hearing that because sometimes we can see so many injustices that when we get that one victory, we really don't take it in and, yeah. and, and see that, yeah, the wheels are turning, even if they're turning slowly. Well, through understanding the process, mm -hmm. we realize that convictions lead to laws. You know, so like when George okay, Floyd... Okay, that's their process. The pro conviction yeah, conviction leads, leads to laws. Leads to laws. Uh -huh. When we're on Capitol Hill and we're, we're pitching the George Floyd Policing Act, mm -hmm. it's because... In Minnesota, 
-hmm. There was an instance that happened with a man yeah. that resulted in a police officer being convicted of murder, mm -hmm. and we've got to keep this from ever happening again. Right. Same with the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Right, you right. Know, the, the, these are things that when we find victories in the courtroom, mm -hmm. we then in return can find victories on Capitol Hill and victories yeah. at the White House and victories mm -hmm. on Supreme Court. So mm -hmm. one victory can open the door to a massive house of victories, yeah. if you will. And that's how change has happened yes, for us absolutely. in this country. Absolutely. One victory at a time. Roe versus Wade. I put it on the list. Yeah. Ruby yeah. Bridges. You know, so All many of those. things. So All many of those. things. So, I want to turn another corner here. Uh, you've really been praised for your work in Black Lives Matter uh, in that movement and orchestrating multiple peaceful marches. But, of course, with praise comes criticism. How, how do you navigate the criticism that comes with being in that spotlight? You know, initially, and I think I said, uh, mentioned this earlier in 2016, mm -hmm. quite a challenge because mm -hmm. um, I was not aware of how big God wanted to move. Okay. Um, I think since then it has called me to a place of just being more accountable, more mm -hmm. responsible, and mm -hmm. just more careful sure. with uh, with who I keep around me. Yeah. And sometimes you could just be guilty by association. Absolutely. Um, so just maturity. And then I have to remind myself, dude, you're 29. Yeah. <laughs> you're 29. Good for you. you, know, you Cut have, yourself some slack. Yeah, ha I have to remind my Devontae, dude, you're 29 years yeah. old. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think for me, the criticisms, you know, I hate to sound arrogant or confident or conceited, but when you're in the will of God, you do have to train your mind. And you so do. I argue with those who uh, bring what I bring to the table or more. Mm -hmm. Everyone else I teach. Okay, okay. I teach. It's like you may not get it now, but you'll have to get it later. And I'm okay with that. You, I'm okay with you not seeing what God is doing right now. Okay. Totally okay with it because I've already seen what he's trying to do. Okay. So, like I said, the same individuals who were calling me a terrorist in mm -hmm. 2016 mm -hmm. are now saying, oh, you're such a great leader in 2020. Isn't that Isn't that something? And so when you're when you're heeding to the voice of God, mm -hmm. you've got to, it's almost like Moses. Yeah. Moses, he even the people that he was leading yeah. had whispers and saying crazy stuff. But he ain't yeah. even Hebrew. He <laughs> absolutely, hanging absolutely. with the Egyptians. You know, uh -huh. he had all those criticisms. Uh -huh. But he remembered that God chose him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God chose him. Yeah. The people didn't choose Moses. Yeah. God chose him. And so for me, I remind myself every day, dude, the Lord has chosen you. And, you, I, you know, you have to do it every day because we're living in such a cancel culture. Yeah. That it's easy yeah. to be on top. You know, yeah. you, one yeah. in the morning and something comes out on you. In every the time. Yeah. Every time. <laughs> and folks are looking for things. Yeah. It's not as if you... Searching. Searching. Yeah. You know, I, I posted this on social media the other day. I was like, when people ask me, what's the sauce to success? Mm -hmm. You know, for me, when I when I hit 30 this year, I will have touched a million dollars. That was wow. my ultimate goal was to be a millionaire by 30. Uh-huh. When people ask me what's the sauce to success, I oftentimes recant Jesus and mm. how close Jesus kept Jonas to him, or mm. Judas, Judas, Judas to him. him. Uh -huh. You know, Jesus knew that he was going to be betrayed, mm -hmm. but he kept them close. Mm. You know, I have fed, I have made comfort, I have made um, mm -hmm. my extra bed available to some of the same people who would later publicly betray me wow. with lies and defamation. I never addressed them about it. I always address the Father. Yeah. It's like, Lord, yeah. you see what's going on. Okay. You either okay. got to, one, deal with them and have mercy on them. Uh -huh. But you've also got to add some stuff to the bag of things that you're going to empty into my life because the suffering of this present time mm. can't be compared to the that's glory it. of God I agree with that that's going to be revealed. Mm -hmm. So when I'm being criticized. Now, okay, wait a minute. He got real spiritual, I'm real sorry. deep on y'all. So, <laughs> I got you know, in, in church cliche, that means you're going to get double for your trouble yeah. is what he's claiming. Saying, that whatever I've had to sacrifice. Sacrifice, whatever persecution um, I have received, I know God's gonna pay me back. Yeah, that's, that's I'm it. trying to make sure the folk get sure because you know, went real God, deep. Right God, there. God has got to pay you for your pain. Yes, pain, punitive damages. Absolutely. And so, uh, criticism for me, you know, I, I, I'm so above it, and so. So wait, okay, so let's slow this down. When you say I'm above it, do you do you say that saying I get over it? Or do you feel the need to defend or, you know, what does I'm above it look like for you? I'm above it for me is understanding that what the Lord is, has, what the Lord has shown me, mm -hmm. it's mandatory that I have the vision of an eagle. 
Okay. You know, I have to fly a bit at a higher altitude mm -hmm. than most people. Yeah. And so I cannot be distracted by what the beautiful peacocks are saying on the ground. Mm -hmm. They're not flying. Okay. Okay. God, God, right. God's showing me something different. <laughs> Don't so, pay attention to the peacock. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, now, I do take my time. I do take my time and listen to those who have mm -hmm. valid concerns and yeah. valid criticisms. But even still, those criticisms comes off as, come off as learning opportunities for okay. me mm -hmm. to hear. You know, for example, in 2020, I learned a lot about... Um, pronoun usages and mm -hmm. so many things yeah, that I just yeah. weren't I just was not aware about yeah, yeah. Um, but of course I was vi villainized about about my lack of knowledge in some of those areas yeah, and so yeah. I acknowledged myself I became Good. abreast to it yeah. and allowed those who continue to criticize to continue to criticize right, right. And just keep going just keep going Absolutely. stay focused and keep going yeah I think that's so important and but that is such a difficult a place to be in that's such a challenge because especially when you know your heart sure. and you know you're you're about the father's sure. business and you mean people sure. well it's hard to hear those criticisms yeah. and even though we say you know I don't listen or I don't care I think you. we 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 care yeah you know sure. we handle sure. it as we mature we handle it better but we care oh very much so <laughs> uh, actually very painful to me initially mm -hmm. in uh, 16 it was just my parents would tell you after like the protests, even in 2020, mm -hmm. uh, after those protests, every single night, uh, Pastor, Pastor, Pastor Linda, every night I would get back into into my house and I would strip off my, and I'm talking about my family every day was at my home cooking dinner, making sure I was okay. Uh -huh. Every night I'd take off my clothes, I'd get in the shower and I'd lay on the floor and just hurl, just cry out to the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and once I would have gotten up off the floor, it's yeah. like, all right, God, I'm ready yeah, for whatever's coming yeah, next. Yeah. You know, it's so I think worship is what really strengthens me through mm -hmm. just serious. I, I I like the word criticism, but some of it wasn't criticism. Some of it was just flat out attacks. Yeah, and I'm okay with it. I'm uh -huh. totally the I'm totally okay with it. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. I, I'm a I'm a threat to the enemy. I'm a yeah. threat to his plan. Yeah, and uh, I realize that, and mm -hmm. I'm okay with it. I like okay. making the enemy okay. upset. Okay. <laughs> All right, the devil, you heard that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're you're very poised. Thank you. You you have this great vision, uh, great connection with the Lord as it relates to His vision for your life, His purpose for your life. But what do you do for fun? What makes you laugh? <laughs> I'm actually really goofy. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, you know, I love cooking. That's my, Do you that, really? That's my therapy. Okay. Um, for me. What kind of cook are you? I mean, you know, I can cook exotic so meals, you bake, about, you I cook just about anything. Really? Yeah. yeah and is yeah. that from those grandparents it that is, raised it you? Is, okay. It is. So a date night for me, you know, in my kitchen cooking with my with with, with well, when yeah, the, come when, on. when the come Lord on. sends it. Come on, they want to hear. Officially <laughs> when he sends it. Okay. Right now it's unofficial, but you know, that's a great night for me. You okay. know, being able to pull away from the news, pull away from my phone. Yeah. You know, I did a week. You know, the young lady that I'm seeing right uh -huh, now, she, uh -huh. she challenged me to take a week off from social media. Okay. So I took a week off from social media and just did normal things like okay. cooking in my kitchen, walking my dog at the dog park. Just, All right. I'm really a normal, normal, normal person. Really? Um, I love the Memphis Grizzlies. I love basketball. So All right. All right. I'm a normal guy. I, the yeah. gym is every day. I'm in the gym every day. Okay. So, uh, All right. Yeah. So, you know, I do a lot of talk about, have a lot of conversations about relationships. Sure. So, so you just I stepped like over come in there. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> so I, we got to have a whole conversation about that okay. because, um, you know, um, somebody said I had another gentleman. He's a pastor on uh, the other. He's the other, another episode, and he said it's kind of like you know, folk are feeling like there's pee in the water out here because women are just feeling like where are all the good guys? What happened? Is is there a shortage? Is there a shortage, or are they looking in the wrong places, or are they presenting themselves wrong? What, what's your take on it? So many complexities <laughs> that actually speak to that. Um, one of the, you know, there's just a lot of complexities that, yeah. that go into yeah. the dating pool right now. I do believe that there's a little too much chlorine in the water. Okay. Um, <laughs> which is why I'm taking my time. I don't know about anyone else. Okay. And being in, 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 in ministry, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, most of our generals would like young preachers, young pastors to 
move into marriage. And I think one of the beautiful women here at your church this, this morning, she said, marriage is a beautiful thing. Yeah. And it really is mm -hmm. when two people have their minds Absolutely. on marriage. Yeah. So I think the city girls, just transparently, and I love JT and all of them, and, uh, but I think the city girls has challenge made it very challenging for men mm. to uh, submit to the idea of one woman because there is a you know I'm just gonna say this All right, come in a viral on, on the shade it. room in a viral <laughs> on the shade room uh, but I think that there are there are complexities like like buy me a Birkin bag and I'm gonna give you some time you know, I'm, I'm going to allow, allow you to take me out to dinner. Okay. Or it's got to be like a fly me out uh -huh. and I'm going to submit to you and only you. You know, so gotcha. it, it, our relationships have just become so transactional Isn't that, that, that we have been robbed of our desire to mm -hmm. out love our partner. Yeah. And so now <laughs> it's almost like how much can you love, love me, me. Right. versus... I want to just pour and shower you with the love that you probably have never experienced. Yeah. And, so, and I mean, and, and I don't know that, I don't know how we get back there if you don't ascribe to a Christian worldview. Yeah. Because that's, that's loving like Christ love. Yeah, unconditional. So yeah. how do we get this culture that we're living in that is so self-centered, that is so consumed with... Um, it being all about me. How do we get there? What is the message to them? And and okay, and then all the guys, none of them want to commit. Even sure. when they find, even when that woman is there saying, you know, I'm a good woman, I'm educated, I make good money, but they still don't want to commit. Sure. I, I think that we have to, as as my generation, of course, we are one wind away from being Buddhist. We talk about chakras. We talk about making sure our chakras are aligned. And you know you stokes. gotta come back because oh, we do all of that carrying on. But as we oh, go you gotta, on these, come, back. You gotta we, come back. You gotta come back. As we go on these journeys of, of self healing and self discovery, we also have to remind ourselves that men or woman, man or woman, mm -hmm. you deserve to be loved. Yeah, yeah. you deserve to be loved. Mm -hmm. And when you continuously remind yourself that you deserve to be loved, mm -hmm. you surround yourself around people who genuinely love you. Yeah. And then you run across that one person, that one girl, mm -hmm. or that one man mm -hmm. that you can't live without their love okay. because you are open to being loved. Some of us, the reason why you got a loyal girl, she got a good job, she got good money, and y'all shouldn't be having sex, but y'all mm -hmm. have good sex mm -hmm. and all these good natures. Yeah, yeah. The reason why you can't submit to just her and only her because you haven't embraced the fact that you deserve to be loved. Mm -hmm. Who okay. didn't love you mm -hmm. to where now you feel like love is something that you don't even know how to handle? Ah, who didn't love you? Maybe that's the issue with the commitment, the non-commitment. Okay, you know, I okay, you have to promise me. Cause you hit on something that, you know, I'm 54, Devontae. Yes, ma'am. And so uh, see, you're calling me. You're calling me yes, you say yes, ma'am. So I'm good with that. Gracefully actually, 54. Absolutely. Uh, but some things when I talk about them, you know, it's coming from a 54-year-old woman, sure. traditional woman. Sure. But now you can come on and you can talk because I've been wondering about the crystals and the I'm going to tell it the, like a T.I.S. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah. I, I got to have you back because we got to have that conversation. We got to have a conversation on moral compass. Yes. And what moral compass do you subscribe to? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I tried to date a young lady and she was this long and it just, in that respect, very respectable absolutely. young lady. Absolutely, absolutely. Just not going to work out. It's not going to mm. work out. You know, you, we got to have that conversation. That moral yeah. compass conversation has got to be and I think, my generation. I think that you talked about the voiceless. You having that voice for your generation. The Bible says David served his generation. I think that's what's needed. Yes, ma'am. That I, I'm talking to my generation, and I pastor your generation, and they... Uh, are submissive to that teaching and all of that, but I, I think still there it's the younger voices that the Lord is calling, male and female, that's going to to give um, perspective beyond what um, the all of the voices out there that's constantly pulling at them, sure, sure. right? That's constantly pulling at them. 
I think that's so needed. And I'm so thankful. I didn't even know I was going to feel what I feel right now. Hallelujah. But I, I'm so thankful that you're willing to take it on. Yes, ma'am. That you're not so consumed with being popular or being a part of the trend of the culture that you're not you're not willing to set the trend, yes, you know, and lead the way because yes, that's ma'am. what Moses did. He led the way, and he led the way when they were criticizing him and and not wanting to go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, Well, that's essentially what the Black Lives Matter, what God is doing with the church in the Black Lives Matter movement. You mm-hmm. know, we got to be really careful because there's a sticky, sticky area of rebellion. Yeah. There somewhere, and even in civil unrest and yeah. civil, you know, the civil disobedience, there is a there is a realm of rebellion that God is trying to establish light in, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And so I think God is looking for because these people who are ascribing to crystals and chakras and the vibe and <laughs> yeah. the energy, these yeah. people, you know, they are searching for something. They're, They're searching, searching for an for answer. Something. Absolutely. And the church and the body of Christ, we've got to be a light in a dark place. Yeah. yeah. Be a light in a dark place. Oh, I got so many other things to ask you about that. <laughs> but anyway, anyway. What what are, what is what is your outlook on Memphis? Are you still confident that change will take place in Memphis? Super excited about the future of Memphis. Okay. I think in the next five years, Memphis mm-hmm. will be an metropolis mm-hmm. um, that will be in the ranks of like Nashville and Austin, okay, or San Antonio. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm eagerly excited. I told Congressman Corn the day that I left mm-hmm. that I was going to come back uh, and I was going to come back and sit in that chair. You know, okay. Make it back. So, All right. Super excited. I'm going to end up running for city council for District Three, Whitehaven. All right. Geeked about that. I am. And uh, well, y'all heard be... it first, right here. I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. Publicly, <laughs> publicly, it's been like the it's been the whisper. So yeah, I'm just awesome. dispelling it. We're going to run for District Three. You're coming 3. back. Running for office. Yeah, that is awesome. Whitehaven is my stumping ground with the Whitehaven High Davis Family YMCA. Yeah. Um, Winchester. I'm from the hood of Whitehaven, and okay. my mom matriculated up into nurse practitioner, and we just moved our way up through Whitehaven, and so that's where oh, I got to go back and leave. That is so wonderful. Yeah. I am, and I'm excited for. I'm from Dallas. Okay. And I love one of the things. I've been, I mean, I've been here now probably 29 years, but I have so wanted to see Memphis grow. Sure. Uh, I remember. Um, Dallas from what it was to what it is now. Everybody yeah. wants to live in Dallas and, you know, it's attracted so many corporations and mm-hmm. so much has happened. So much culture is there now. Uh, and I and I have longed for Memphis uh, to, to, to move. I, I'm okay with a small town feel, mm-hmm. but I definitely want um, um, – a mega mindset. I want Memphis to see that it could be we're so headed, much larger. We're headed, so, we're headed to yeah. be. We're headed to be the the symbolism of Black excellence aside I love from Atlanta. It. Okay, I, that's what I see. For okay, Memphis. Black ex. I love yeah. it. I love it. So what's next? I know that's you know you're coming back here, but when we talk about what's next for Devonte Hill, how how what's the time span for that? Um, you so, coming back here. So I still have my house here. Right now okay. I'm traveling between Memphis, Atlanta, Dallas. And okay. AD call me a mad scientist right now. <laughs> Literally just landed in from Dallas, as you mentioned it. Uh, I'm doing a work with Mark Cuban, uh, billionaire Mark Cuban, owner uh-huh. of Dallas Mavericks. Uh-huh. We are launching a credit card in 30 days, an actual really? credit card okay. that will dismantle title loan companies and predatory lending practices. Wow. It's going to be so cool. I'm so excited about Ooh. it. It was just God breathed the way that it happened. Um, so we're working on that. That's why I'm consistently in Dallas all the time. Yeah. Because that's where our headquarters is. And I own 10% of the company. So that's just really uberly exciting. That's exciting yes. season. Yes. In Atlanta, I've submitted to my pastor, Dr. Jamal Bryan, for okay. a season. You know, I don't know why young pastors and young preachers did this thing during the pandemic of trying to, like, launch churches. Uh-huh. When, like, we just need to just go to the mothership. Can, yeah. And they, make the mothership go. And, well, I think that was really... Um, Something that was already the undercurrent that no one wanted to be under. Yeah, anyone I, else I that love was... submission. You know, and meeting my father mm-hmm. made it easy for me to submit to my pastor. Okay. And so we'll let people dispel what what okay. the formula looks like there. Okay. But you know, when you when you understand how to be a great son, yeah, it'll open the door and open the heart of the father every time. So absolutely, working with Labonner, Labonner is uh, launching a massive initiative to combat gun violence against young, among young people. Mm. 
And so we've got a lot of moving pieces right now. Just just asking God to continue to strengthen us mm. and keep moving us. And I'm going to be praying for you. I'm you. telling you, you're going on my prayer list in my prayer journal. Thank you. Uh, because you've got a great work ahead of you. Appreciate and Memphis needs you. Um, as we, you know, as you said, as we begin to go into this next uh Post-COVID, yeah. I'm going to say that, post, because I'm just believing God. It's coming to an end. Yeah, post-COVID era. Um, before we go, how can young professionals and youth get involved in the movement? What, what, Where do we go? I'm, I'm going to have um, Pastor Fisher on uh, my next, uh, in a couple of weeks, and we're going to be talking about Black Lives Matter and where we are mm -hmm. uh, now. But what... Somebody's listening today, and they're sure. saying they're being inspired by you. Wonderful. Where do they start? I think we have to start by becoming involved, as you as you say. We got to be involved with civic processes like voting. Mm -hmm. um, Pastor Fisher has a great organization, Up the Vote 901. Absolutely. We've got to make sure that we are undergirding organizations, historical organizations that have been around for a long time, for a long time, to continue uh -huh. to, to continue to strengthen their voices, like okay. the NAACP. Okay. Um, like the Rainbow Push Coalition. These are organizations that as black people, or even not just black people, people of color, uh -huh. that we have to support these organizations because those organizations are going to be the front runners mm -hmm. when, everything, when, when something goes wrong. Okay. So that's okay. a great way. We've got to become aware and involved with who we are electing, our elected mm -hmm. officials. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we don't like what's happening, but we don't vote. Right. You know, we don't. We don't. We don't like. We don't like our legislative processes. But we have no hand in it at all. Yeah. So we have to start voting. We have to make sure that our relatives, our cousins, our nieces and nephews are mm -hmm. voting, because that that other party is coming back with with vengeance. You better know it. And so we have no time to sleep. <laughs> We've got to get Absolutely with the program. Not. Now Absolutely. is the time for young people to get involved. If not, we will pay the cost um, when mm -hmm. we start bringing children into the world, right. and we will wish right. that we were more involved then. Mm. So it's almost like a stock exchange. Are you going to put money in now or wish you had put it in later? Absolutely. All right. Y'all heard it right here. Get involved. And he said, now is the time. Now is the time. Now is the time. Get your kinfolk, your nieces, your nephews, your kids. You know they're not voting. I call my kids and say, uh, did you vote yeah. today? I, yeah. call, I do. I do. If you don't vote, we can't be friends. <laughs> I don't even be friends right. with people who don't vote. Like, why, why are you here? <laughs> I know. It. I know. You're going to either be a part of the change, yeah. you know, or you're going to be the problem. Yeah. Anyway, it's been so good Thank to you have you. Me. I know you're a busy man, but can will you just give me your word that you'll stop back through? Oh, it's a promise. Because I got to talk to you. You, you, you got like three or four issues right there that you have such a powerful word Thank to you. speak that I just got to have you back. I'm certainly coming back for sure. Okay. Anything for you and Bishop. All right then. Listen, I'm always out of time, but y'all know I'm never out of conversation. Tune in each Sunday evening at 7, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time for Conversations with Linda. This has been just a joy and an inspiration to have the Reverend Devontae Hill here in our studio. God bless you.